So we've heard these lofty goals. Everybody uh, is signing up for them. But what does it mean in the real world? As you're doing deals, as you're managing assets, is it changing what you do? Uh, on the asset management side of the business, absolutely. Um, that, that's changing rapidly. On the advisory side of the business, which is arranging mergers and acquisitions, uh, that's on the come, so to speak. We're seeing the beginning of it, but it's, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, let me speak to the asset management side to begin with. Uh, one has to step back and realize this has been in play now for several years. The first thing that happened is the core demographic that drives activity in the economy started spending their values. That was, I don't know, a couple of years ago, in three, four, or five years ago in the United States, longer in Europe. Over the last couple of years, everybody, it has shifted now, so that same demographic is starting to invest their values. And that's playing through in the asset owners, and it's really having a big impact on the asset management business. So when you talk about investing in assets, uh, is it defense or offense? And by that I mean this. It's one thing to say, I don't want to invest, for example, in a fossil fuels company. Okay, I get that. But what about affirmatively investing in a green steel company? Um, I think in the beginning, it's going to be defensive because at this moment in time, there's very little that that kind of ties uh, green performance, whether you are uh, your emissions policy, your social policies. There's very little that actually ties that to performance in the stock market or cost of capital. That's at its very early stages. But scoring companies is there. So I'd say at this moment in time, we're probably doing, I would say most of asset management is, is investing defensively around, around ESG, and I think that's going to shift over time. Uh, we, had, we heard from a former Vice President Al Gore this week saying that we have something of a, I think he called it a climate subprime crisis coming, because there's trillions of dollars in assets in coal and in fossil, other fossil fuels uh, that may not be worth actually what we think they're worth because they'll never get used. Is there a looming problem with that? In the long run, yes. In the short run, in the medium term, we're going to have many ups and downs. You know, uh, a year, a year and a half ago, when, when oil was trading at a negative value, who would have predicted close to a $100 oil price a year, year and a half away? So I think what we're going to see is a lot of um, what I would almost describe as uh, uncertainty and, um, syst and, 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 um, and outlier kinds of experiences over the next several years. I think in the long run, he's probably right, as we make that transition to uh, uh, the energy transition to renewables and to uh, more uh, green types of energy, that will happen. But in the med short and medium term, we could have a lot of ups and downs. So what do you do as an asset manager in that circumstance? Because we have a short-term supply problem, for example, <clears throat> natural gas in Europe. And we've seen the prices spike up. And we've seen energy company stock actually go up. So in the short run, you actually might be able to make some money because the money market may have overly discounted the value of those stocks. Yeah, well, I don't think it's as black and white today as that asset managers can't invest in oil and gas and energy stocks. I think we're slowly, maybe even more rapidly than some would like, moving in a direction where it becomes less attractive to do that. But at the moment, there's still ways for people to invest and make money in the short and medium term on those kind of spikes and, and movements in price. At this point, are there enough really attractive alternatives on the green front? Now I'm talking about the offensive part, yes. uh, whether it's solar or whether it's new technology. I've, I've talked to some people who manage a fair amount of money who say, you know, that even though I want to invest a lot of money, there aren't that many good deals to be done. Well, I think that's going to, again, I think it's going to evolve. As, as you start to build in the incentives, both from the standpoint of where capital goes, and I mean, if, if as an example, uh, there is a real incentive for people to invest in, in green projects, then the cost of capital for those projects goes down mm -hmm. and those projects become more attractive to invest in. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as time goes on. Also, the investment that's taking place in technology, uh, everything from storage to uh, wind, solar that have taken place over the last couple of decades have made an enormous difference in creating opportunities in, in this area. And I think that's just going to continue. Uh, so, so as you look at possible assets to invest in, uh, how many many things do you find that you can invest in that really have attractive returns? Do you have to get used to taking a lower return as a practical matter to accomplish some of the ESG goals? Uh, not necessarily. Again, one has to uh, look. On, on one hand, you can look at what's happening in the uh, electric vehicle space, and you can see Tesla at a, a plus trillion dollar valuation, Lucid and a couple of the other car manufacturers at 60 billion. This is an area where there's just been enormous investment um, and just spectacular returns for people over a period of time. Uh, I think we're going to see. Uh, 
uh, opportunities here for a long period of time, as long as people believe we are really moving to, that we're really on a path for energy transition. If, on the other hand, this reverses itself, which, frankly, I don't think is going to happen because of this, what I would call this demographic, uh, this economic demographic that's really pushing this, um, I don't think it's going to reverse. But it, should it reverse, it changes things. But as long as people think we're on this path, then these technologies, are, then there's going to be an enormous investment in these technologies. Because the payoff is going to be huge. That raises the question of where we are on the path. I mean, all of us have learned maybe the hard way that if you can't measure, you can't manage it. Uh, so <laughs> yes. how do we measure this? How do we know where we are on that path and whether we're making progress, even if we really want to badly? Well, I think there are some indicators. You know, 15 years ago, one would have, or before the, uh, uh, the financial crisis, uh, it, when uh, oil and gas prices were spiking in uh, 05, 06, um, one would have said there's no point in um, investing in renewables. How do you compete in geothermal? How do you compete in solar? How do you compete in wind? And prices have come down 70 to 90 percent since that point in time, which have made all of those technologies at a much lower oil price, in fact, and a much lower natural gas price competitive. Today, those technologies are very competitive, and, and that's the kind of investment that's going to take place. You come down the cost curve, it drives that. We're likely to see that over the next decade or two around hydrogen. We're certainly like to see that. We're, we're likely to see that around storage over the next couple of years, over the next decade as well. Uh, so that raises the question, in my mind at least, about the government, because mm -hmm. if the markets are taking care of it, maybe we don't need the government to do anything, or do we need the government to set some of the rules for us? Well, I think there's two places the government can be really helpful. The first is in setting the rules. Um, there are going to be standards around disclosure that are just going to be necessary to create a level playing for, field for companies and also for investors. And I think the SEC is, is, is moving, it appears to be moving aggressively around that. The second, and, and along the same lines, the accounting standards around disclosure are going to be a very important as well. So some standard setting around that is really important. The second thing government can do is it can pick a few areas where no one else can invest, can invest efficiently. To, to make a difference. It, just as an example, in the infrastructure bill, there are two areas that, um, uh, that the um, Congress is focused on and the administration is focused on. One is around EV infrastructure and the second is around the grid. Those are two examples where if you can accelerate that or you, can, you make that work, then it makes the transition from, electric, from gas vehicles to electric vehicles just much more efficient, much quicker, because electric vehicles, of course, need to worry about the EV infrastructure. And ultimately, you know, the, the grid is going to become even more important than it is today with electric vehicles. For an investor, mm -hmm. how important is it that there be international cooperation on this? I mean, because otherwise we could have countries competing with each other in a bad way. Absolutely. There's got to, again, there's got to be some standards, because you can imagine a scenario where uh, one, uh, uh, one geography, let's just say, the, the European Union decides, look, we're going to start taxing uh, carbon differently if it, if, uh, on products coming from the United States if they don't have the right policies, or from China if they don't have the right policies. So, it's, so you can end up in a pretty protectionist regime pretty quickly if you don't have uh, common standards globally. You said when it comes to ESG for Lazard Ferrer that the asset management side is a little bit ahead of where the merger advisory side is. Where is the merger advisory side? Well, right what now? I would say on, well, first, first of all, on the asset side, we've made huge investments to, to really position ourselves in this area. On the advisory side, Side, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're launching a climate center in uh, December, and uh, one of the first areas we're going to be focused on is the impact of the energy transition on cost of capital and, um, and ultimately stock price. There's very little uh, evidence in the market today or literature in the market today that really takes and ties those two together. That's going to be critically important in terms of understanding how to value transactions that are either, either carbon accretive, carbon dilutive in, in an M&A context. And I think that's going to happen over time.